So I want to talk today about um, some things I was thinking about over the last few months about how the QRP Labs kits had evolved over the years and there were some trends through the years and the kit development and I kept reusing things. And then I want to talk about a little bit about the new design I've been working on over the last few months. So I want to start my story in a faraway place a long time ago. Okay, not that long ago, but it feels like a very long time ago. This was uh, four and a half months ago, New Year. And uh, some good friends around and some family and food, drink, very nice time. Happy New Year. And what do you do after Happy New Year? New Year's resolutions, right? Let's make a million dollars. I don't know why money always comes first, but it's the first thing you think about. I'm going to lose 25 pounds. You can see I'm not doing too well on that. In Turkey, where I live, we call this the Turkish balcony, you know? So I'm <laughs> not doing very well on that one. I have my first SSB QSO. Never had an SSB QSO. I've done CW and digital modes, but uh, be nice to the wife. Happy wife, happy life. Be nice to the kids. And several other equally impossible goals as these five. <laughs> anyway, I got to thinking as well. Have you noticed that every year you make the same New Year's resolutions? Year after year. And do you know why that is? It's because you never actually manage to do them. But the next year you still want to do them. So I started thinking about this and I realized there's a lot of difference between a dream and a plan. A plan makes something happen and a dream motivates you to carry out the plan. So I think you have a dream about being in Dayton and talking about something interesting blah, 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 but unless you have a plan to actually make something interesting, it's not going to happen. So I started looking back, and I was sitting there after the new year had just gone past, and we were sitting there, and uh, I was thinking about all these things and thinking about all the good things about that had made QRP Labs kits and all the bad things that had gone wrong and, and how I could sort of learn from that and take something from it and make a plan. So I went right back to the beginning, and I was standing... Here, where I'm standing today in, in uh, 2010 with the first QRP Labs kits, a uh, bit more hair, a bit less balcony, but same geek at the end of the day. And uh, this was the first QRP Labs kit, which was a very simple QRSS transmitter. But, uh, and that 8-pin microcontroller that you see up there at the top left had some code in it to generate a very, very slow CW signal. And some of you may have remembered that and actually even built it. And um, it, was, it was quite a, a thing. And it may interest you to know that the code which I wrote for that is still in almost all the QRP Labs kits. Same code got inherited into the QCX, the, the, the uh, U3S, and all of these, these kits along the way. So it's interesting how the techniques, the software techniques, the hardware blocks just keep come, going through the, the evolution of the kits, and then each new kit, something new is added. There are 100 kits that we brought uh, to, the, uh, to, to Dayton, and all 100 of them sold out on the vendor evening. And there was a big pile up snaking around the room. I was on a table up in the corner there, and uh, it was very exciting, but very tiring. After a couple of years, that led to the ultimate CurSS Whisper Beacon kit, where I added customizability and you could have, it was the first kit that did Whisper, a standalone Whisper kit. So up until that time, everyone had been using a PC to generate the audio tones for Whisper and feed to an SSB transceiver. But this was a very lightweight, simple little kit that just did uh, Whisper standalone, as well as CW, QRSS, FSK, Hellschreiber, all these other modes. And after a couple of years, that led on to Ultimate 2. And... Again, much of the code was ported over and inherited and then enhanced, built upon. Things got developed. And this one was kind of the same LCD, um, but it added, it replaced a simple crystal oscillator with this uh, DDS module, which was an AD9850 DTS, available from e eBay and various sources very cheaply at that time. And it had this low-pass filter that plugged in so you could change the band. And so that was quite a, you know, a major thing that we could now just plug in filters to change the band. After some time, that became the Ultimate 3 kit. Um, 
And again, nearly all the code was inherited and it was changed to this new LCD. This new LCD only needed four, four control signals and that freed up a bunch of IO on the processor to uh, control this six band relay switch. So now we could cycle through six different bands and transmit on each band in sequence and program it to do all sorts of things. So it added flexibility and so on. So it was quite nice to have all of those, again, much of the design stayed the same and in adding something each time. A little bit later than that, this is I think beginning of 2015, this evolved into the Ultimate 3S kit. Um, this had this SI53518A synthesizer chip. The main reason for that was that the AD9850, these very cheap DDS modules, had doubled in price and become unobtainable. I think they were a black market board that was available on eBay and, and everything in, from China. And I'd used up about two and a half thousand of them sending these kits out. And uh, I think it used up all the supply. And the price went, I think you can still get them, but they're about $14, $15. So they really went up in price. 30. Wow. Long time since I've checked, Jack. <laughs> So, and that also extended the frequency range upward because the SI5351A can operate up to 200 megahertz. So this provided a uh, two meter operation. It spawned a whole bunch of other kits that were largely compatible with the Ultimate 3S and could be plugged in. Um, so it, it generated a whole load of ideas like this was the OCXO, oven controlled crystal oscillator. I think the only kit built oven controlled crystal oscillator was the uh, ovens were made of PCB and snapped out of a main PCB. Um, a receiver module, Arduino shield, a five watt power amplifier, GPS, um, and then a VFO and a clock kit were separate. So all of these spun off, but again, so many of them, like the clock kit and the VFO kit, use the same hardware, the same actual board as the Ultimate 3S, a lot of the same code and everything. So I was kind of reusing things, reusing hardware ideas, reusing software ideas and just adding on something new each time. This one is important, in, uh, and you'll see why a little bit later. The 5 watt power amplifier for the Ultimate 3S actually had this amplitude controlled, um, th this amplitude controller. So you could drive it with a digital to analog converter that was on, that's actually on the board, this chip on the right hand side here. And you could generate a very nice raised cosine key shaping as you see it there in your oscilloscope picture. And so um, that was important because, again, that was ideas that I was able to use later as I'll come on to. 2017 was the first uh, of the transceivers that I designed and was a very, very big moment because I had wanted to do a, a transceiver for a long while. And again, it incorporated so many of the things I had done already. So the receiver module, for example, has a quadrature sampling detector, a TALO detector. This had the same thing in it. And essentially, up until that point, I had designed all of the various modules that would make up the QCX, but they're all in different modules. And if you try to make a transceiver by connecting together all these different modules, you need some kind of motherboard to plug them all into, and the cost skyrockets. So the aim of this was to make a very high performance, very low cost transceiver on a single board. Um, it's all analog, but it has a microcontroller controlling everything. Many of you probably have built this transceiver or the later uh, variants of the transceiver. Um, one of the things that upset me about this was I had such a bad mechanical design and it was very hard to put this in an enclosure because the buttons and the rotary controllers and the LCD are all at different heights off the circuit board. The connectors are on both sides. And so it was very hard to put this into an enclosure. And that was one of the things I'd always regretted about it. There was a German company that made the enclosures uh, for this, and they had engineered shaft extenders and extenders for the buttons and, and all of this stuff. Um, and they made an enclosure for it, but you know they were uh, profiting from my design and adding this enclosure. And so uh, in 2020, I decided to change it to the QCX Plus. Uh, it was exactly the same circuit, firm, well, almost the same circuit. Uh, firmware is exactly the same basically just a new mechanical design uh, with this very nice uh, black aluminum extruded enclosure. And again, a couple of extra additions. So again, the, you see these additions being added uh, as the kits evolve. 
one of the additions was a TCXO option, which is a tiny little board that was soldered in. And then later on, there was an AGC option. There was a dev board kit that gives you more option to fit your own modifications. Um, then there are a bunch of people who said, oh, but the QCX Plus is too big. We like the old QCX because it was smaller, it was lighter. It's more convenient for SOTA and portable operations. And so I did the QCX Mini, which was just a baby version of the QCX Plus. So it's the same, again, same circuit, same firmware, um, but just a different mechanical design. As you can see here, it's been astonishingly, astonishingly successful uh, product line in the cross the range um, in what's it been almost six years just under 20,000 of these kits have been sold um, so really huge number that was beyond any of my wildest expectations uh, when I first designed it you know I thought I'm going to have to work hard to sell the 500 kits that I'd produced and here we are at almost 20,000. So here are the three uh, QCXs uh, next to each other. The one in the middle is, as I said, the um, German uh, case, the German engineered enclosure that was made for the original QCX. And of course, the mini on the left and the plus on the right. So that was my, was, you know, QCX was a single band um, analog CW transceiver, five watts output. A lot of features like preset memories, um, frequencies, dual VFO, RIT, CW decoder, Kia built in, uh, Whisper Beacon built in, all of these features. Uh, QSX was the SSB or is the SSB transceiver uh, product. You know, a year after QCX, I was buoyed by the success of the QCX and the tremendous popularity. And I was thinking, I can do anything. Um, no. <laughs> the gap. And this is a problem, the gap, when you have a very large gap, it takes a lot of work to fill that gap. And the gap between QCX, it seems like the natural progression would go from CW to sideband, but the gap between CW and a side, an all band, all mode, 10 watt sideband transceiver with embedded SDR from a simple analog single band transceiver is quite a large gap. And that was the, um, kit project for the 2018 Yota Buildathon, And of course, after that, everybody knew about it. Everybody was writing suggestions. You need to add this feature, that feature. Everybody was piling on pressure. How long is it going to be until you finish? And it's a very creative process that doesn't really work very well under pressure. And so I kept kind of postponing it and thinking I'll spend more time on it next week. And, you know, it, it just drifted and drifted. And it's taken very much longer than I had hoped to finish. I'm dealing with this now because in the question and answers, people always ask me, what about QSX? And I always have to threaten violence on their head if they ever mention it again, or threaten that I'm gonna you know, bury them in the concrete under my new antenna tower when I build it and all of this stuff. So I'm dealing with this now, so we don't have to revisit this in the Q and A, okay? I don't have an estimate. Anyway. 2021, I designed the QDX transceiver, which is a very high performance digital modes transceiver with multiple bands. So it covers 80, 20, 80, 60, 40, 30, and 20 in the original version. And then later there was a high band version, which now covers 20 to 10 meter versions, uh, 20 to 10 meter bands. And we have a single band version too, which will hopefully eventually make versions for 160, 630, and 2,200 meters. Um, so very nice digital transceiver design. I gave the presentation on this last year, so I'm not going to go into great detail, but it is important for what I'm coming on to next to understand a bit about it. Um, with a TCXO referenced uh, SI551A synthesized LO, it has an embedded SDR doing all the work. So not an external SDR program on a, on a PC or something, but the DSP is all done in the chip inside the radio. And it also emulates a very high performance 24-bit stereo sound card. So the transfer of audio back and forth between the PC is entirely digital over this USB interface, USB cable, with zero loss, zero distortion, no possibility of audio ground loops, hum, hum or anything like that. So it's got a number of 
sort of advanced uh, advantages. The same USB cable cover carries CAT control, so it's very easy to interface to your Digimodes programs like uh, WSJTX, change the frequency, transmit, receive switching, and all of that. The other thing is that all of the relay switching in here was done using pin diodes rather than with relays, so it also makes it very compact. Um, I think I have a picture on the next slide. Yep, a look inside. Um, it's very, very compact. This is uh, basically this height here for scale purposes is about two inches, um, 63 millimeters, two and a half inches, and the height around one inch. Um, again, many of you have probably probably got one of these. And um, we, I also use this new power amplifier that I developed that is a push-pull class D power amplifier, switching power amplifier. And it has the benefit being push-pull that the even harmonics are extremely low. And therefore, it simplifies the requirement on the low-pass filters. And so instead of needing three toys per band, we're able to use two, two toys per band and, also, and even share the uh, last low-pass filter here between 20 and 30 meters. So a number of advantages. The other very unique thing about this transceiver was that up until then, uh, single sideband transceivers had been required for FT8 and these digital modes. You take the audio from the PC and an SSB exciter, which transmits it. What I did instead here was measuring the audio frequency. And these are slides, just a couple of slides I picked from last year's presentation. Um, I measure the audio frequency and then I command the SI53518 to produce the USB dial frequency plus the measured audio frequency. And then you update that 100 times a second and measuring the, even a single cycle of audio is extremely accurate. A single cycle at 1500 Hertz has about an accuracy of 0 0.005 Hertz. And the reason for that is because you get this stream of 16 bit samples over the USB interface with zero noise no distortion or anything. So you get very, very perfect samples from WSJTX, which you can then use to interpolate to find the exact zero crossing. This is a block diagram of QDX, and um, you can see it's a fairly conventional IQ-based direct conversion SDR transceiver. You have a transmit receive switch, a band pass filter here, quadrature sampling detector again, um, again, as I said, you know, I, I keep reusing these blocks as the kits develop. And TALO detector is something I've been using for 20 years or so. I, I really like using it in my homebrew projects and then in the kit projects. Um, pin diode switching, which I had previously used in the QCX amplifier um, and in the 10 watt linear, which I developed for the QSX. So QSX has some uh, pin diode switching as well. Um, and this feeds into some low noise differential instrumentation amplifiers into a high performance ADC, and then the microcontroller that does all the hard work of the embedded SDR. It actually embeds a 12 kilohertz IF superhet rather than a direct conversion. And the reason for doing that is because if you do the, all the work at 12 kilohertz, you avoid this problem of noise near zero kilohertz, which is very hard to get rid of. So it improves the performance. So QDX was basically all the things that I had done up until then. And in fact, the code for QDX was started from the code I wrote for QSX. So it's, um, it's putting into production a lot of the things which were already intended for QSX. And so some smart people have observed that although QSX is not here yet, everything that came in, in the intervening period is kind of steps on the way, and the gap is kind of shrinking all the time uh, to get towards QSX in the end. Um, I think that QCX will be the last analog radio that I design as a product, although as a hobby, I do a lot of analog radios and even tube radios I enjoy. But for a product, I think software-defined radio embedded software defined radio is the way to go because you get a much higher performance per price ratio. Um, and it gives you the chance to put in new features just by releasing a firmware update. And QDX has a very unique way of doing firmware updates that when you go into the firmware update mode, 
it, is, it appears on the screen as a USB flash drive, and you're just copying the file like, like you would just copy a file onto USB flash drive, and it does the firmware update. So it's very, very easy, and anyone can do it with any operating system without any special hardware, without any special software. I also do all the floating point stuff, in all the DSP with 32-bit floating point. Um, some of the embedded SDRs that you see use 16-bit integer arithmetic. Um, that limits the dynamic range that you're able to represent in 16-bit. It's much more accurate to use 32-bit. Uh, and then I send 24-bit audio back to the PC, so it really provides very high performance. There were some people who had um, compared QDX with ICOMs, Kenwoods, and so on, and said that QDX was giving a better performance. So, and it also has this um, connection you can connect with a terminal emulator on a PC, and there are a whole suite of applications and tools that you can use that will sweep the RF uh, bandpass filters and, and uh, show you the image rejection so that you can do all this diagnosis and testing and optimization. So in each band, for example, you'd run this and you see, okay, 40 meters, this blue line uh, that you see here is the re representing the seven megahertz, 40 meter band. So you'd see how oh, my peak of my bandpass filter is a little bit lower in frequency. I need to stretch out the turns on the bandpass that resonance up a bit. And you can do all of that from these terminal applications which are built in. So having said all of that, now I want to talk about what I've been working on. And I hope you can see that you know, with all of this stuff, I kept adding more and more things to my kind of toolbox, and uh, both hardware things and software things. And so with this, I wanted now to move on to what I've been developing for the last few months, which is basically the plan part of what we were talking about after the New Year's resolutions. This is the marriage of QDX and QCX Mini, and basically provides a CW mode transceiver and a digital mode transceiver um, together. So basically trying to take some of the parts of QCX Mini and some of the parts of QDX, and then very, very importantly, making it something that's a feasible project that can be accomplished with a good plan, rather than the pie in the sky dream, which is such a massive gap that it can't be done in a few months. And so I tried to keep it very realistic by basically combining as much as I could from these two very successful product products to make a combined product. And the result is what I'm calling QMX, where M is for marriage, for merger, multi-band, multi-mode, magnificent, marvelous, whatever you want to say. Um, and it's basically, you can see here, it's, this is the QMX transceiver. It's the same size enclosure as QCX Mini, which I have one here. Um, very, very small, uh, in, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very, very small uh, CW transceiver. So it's the same mechanical design. Um, I really like the mechanical design for QCX Mini and that it fits in such a small enclosure. Um, people like that controls and display on the top for portable operation. It's a nice form factor for that. So it keeps all the mechanical design from QCX Mini. And inside is more of a QDX. It's an embedded SDR again. As I said, I think for moving forward, I will always do everything with SDR. Um, so it's basically QDX plus an LCD buttons and encoders, so the user interface, an audio headphones output, a paddle connector, SWR bridge, so it also does include SWR monitoring, uh, which is a very nice and important feature, as well as switching power supplies and RF envelope shaping, shaping for the CW keying so that you don't have key clicks. So other than the paddle connector, which is just the same as a, as a QCX Mini, it's just a connector, each of those things, each of those other new things on there I want to talk about. So the, the, the actual radio has the same left panel with just the audio output, the paddle and the DC input. And everything on the right panel is the same except the uh, CAT serial port on a QCX Mini is a, is a serial data 
uh, five volt logic serial data, whereas on here it's a USB C connector. So we'll go through each of those in turn. I pulled one of the feet off here by putting it in my pocket. Um, firstly, a little bit more about that USB C connector. Sometimes people might think, oh, it's USB C, you can connect it to my power bank and it will take power and all of that. Not in this case. The only reason I used USB C was because the USB B connector, which I use in the QDX, is too large. And in the, QC, in, the, in the QMX, because I've got this LCD module, I don't have space to put a, a, a full-size USB connector underneath. USB micro tends to be unreliable. Um, back when Android phones were all USB, USB micro, the first thing to fail was the, the connector. Um, USB mini I like, but you can't find the cables very easily. It's not very popular. So USB-C was a good solution for that. I chose a very high, high quality USB connector, which I get from DigiKey um, and with, a, with through hole pins rather than just surface mount, because this is a connector which is gonna get some mechanical force and keep pulling out, putting in the cable. So it's crucial that it's a good quality uh, connector. So that provides the USB connection, just like in QDX for virtual 24 bit USB stereo sound card and the CAT control port, um, it actually provides, because it's a more a higher performance processor, it provides enough uh, power to do two serial ports over the same USB cable. So it really implements like a, a USB hub where, with plugged into it a USB sound card and two serial to USB connectors. It's also used for the firmware update, as I mentioned just now. This is the main board of the QMX. It's the same size as a QCX mini main board. Um, the Torres have shrunk. Um, not everyone will like that, but I have to squeeze a lot of stuff into a small space. Um, so the Torres are size T30 Torres now. Um, you can see down here on the bottom right side, the uh, SWR bridge. Um, here's the bandpass filter and the trifiller transformer just like you see in the QDX. Most of the circuit is, is very much like the QDX, but with those additions. Here it is with uh, these two additional boards. So if I go back one, you'll see this, this whole space here, but these uh, pin header connectors. And that's where you plug in the, these two uh, controls, the, these two PCBs for the buck converter boards uh, to efficiently generate the power rails. Um, it's also got the uh, controls board, uh, just the same, very similar to the QCX Mini. So it's a real marriage between the QCX Mini and the QDX with, with pieces taken from each design. Um, here it is with the LCD module plugged in on top. Again, this is the, all the mechanical design directly from QCX Mini, and that slides into the enclosure rails, and, and the main board hangs beneath that, bolted underneath with these spacers. It's a single PCB design, uh, which then breaks out into all of those other pieces. So whereas QCX Mini was done on two PCBs, in this case, I've done it just all on a single PCB design. So you've got the controls board here that breaks out uh, and plugs in with the rotary encoders and then the two power supply boards here. The reason I did two power supply boards was because if I had done one, it would have been a lot thicker and therefore the PCB would have come a, a lot wider and that would have increased the cost. So I split it into two so that I could more efficiently use all the space. There's also this little waste PCB piece here. And I put the QRP Labs logo on both sides and a hole in the middle. So you can actually file it smooth and use it as a key fob or something like that. So if you're a real QRP Labs fan, you put this key fob, you put this on your key ring, you see. Or you get your wife to wear it as a pendant or... You buy two and have earrings, exactly. You're thinking ahead here. You're reading my mind. And um, so that's the, that's the board. Um, and that's the bottom side. You see on the bottom side, you've got all of the, uh, there's the CPU and, and all of the bits and pieces here. Um, the bottom side of the switch mode regulators has or just a ground plane because I wanted to try to shield the noise um, as much as possible. Here it is with all the separated pieces of board. So you see, like just like the where is my thing? Just like the QCX Mini, it has these um, 
little spacers which are used to mount the control board. And then here are the two buck converter boards and the key fob board, the all important key fob board for people's earrings. This is a close up of the power supply boards um, during the construction process. So you then solder these uh, female pin headers. You, it's my kind of idea of putting these female pin headers with the board slid in between the two rows of pins because it fits very, very nicely and it provides this kind of edge, very low cost edge connecting. Remember the old uh, PCBs that used to plug into a, a, a card bus with an edge connector. This is a very low cost way of doing that. So you have these right angled male pin headers and then standard female pin headers that just uh, mounted onto the board as, as like an edge connector. So there are the two power supply boards plugged in. This is a, a bunch of all the through hole components which you have to solder. So it's basically all of these capacitors are all involved in the low pass filter and the band pass filter. And the reason why I make those through hole components is so that I can guarantee the quality is good NPO, uh, NP0 uh, RF dielectric capacitors, which I get from DigiKey. And also because in the future, I hope that we will have a high band version of this that covers 10 to 20 meters, just like with QDX. So this allows um, people to customize what band selection they have. So uh, it's for 80 to 80 to 20 meter bands, but if you wanted to customize it for different bands and design the low pass filtering and band pass filtering, you could have a different selection of bands just by changing these uh, uh, capacitor values and the number of turns you put on the toroids. Um, Again, uh, all the SMD components are pre-assembled, so there's nothing to do with SMD. So it's only through hole components uh, to be to be mounted. This is very interesting. I had to use a six layer board for this, and some people, and the reason for that was because the component density is much higher than the QDX or the Q6 mini. and so I tell you a couple of stories about this. It's very interesting. So, so the component density is much higher. And in order to be able to route all of those traces, I thought I'll have to use a four layer board to do this. When I started looking at it, I thought, yeah, I can do it with a four layer board, but there won't be very much in terms of ground plane. And for really you need a lot of ground plane when you have digital circuits operating on the same board as analog circuits. This whole debate about separate analog and digital ground plane, I don't really agree that you need a separate analog and digital ground plane in a transceiver like this. There's a lot of electrical engineers you can look up on, on YouTube that explain why having separate analog and digital ground planes is a bad thing. Um, I don't know if it's true or not which side, but I came down on the side that ground is good, big lots of ground everywhere, but all the same ground. Um, so I have, then I added six layers. So two of the internal layers are just purely ground uh, for ground return signals. It's very important if you've got a signal transit transiting between one layer and another, that you have a ground via nearby so that, you, that, that carries the return currents. Otherwise you get this kind of little dipoles existing, uh, which can emit noise or pick up noise. It's also very important to have ground stitching at very frequent intervals between the ground planes so that you don't create any sort of big cavities on the inside of the board, which can also pick up noise. So I went for six layers, which was a whole new experience for me. I've never ever done more than top layer, bottom layer. It wasn't as scary as it sounds. I'm sure there are people here <laughs> who've done multi-layer boards and know all about it. But the big shock came when I came to order prototypes. And you know, normally you send off your order to somewhere in China for five PCB prototypes and they cost a dollar each or something. My bill for five prototypes was $275. And I said, okay, fine, it's a six layer board. And the reason for this is for one thing, of course, manufacturing a six layer board is more complex than a top bottom board, but also the fact that not so many people want a six layer board. And so they have to, they can't pile together so many orders together on to, in one manufacturing run. And so it was $275 and it goes through an audit process to check everything. And so the next day I logged into the PCB account and I, to check on the progress of the order and whether there were any problems. What did I see? They wanted another $2,000. 
on top of the $275 I'd already paid them. So I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's a lot of money for five circuit boards, right? And it would come down a lot when you came to do 500, 1,000, whatever. It would come down a lot in price, but still it was very high. So I wrote them in emails, so what's going on? Why is, what is this $2,000 extra you want from me? I paid you 275 already. And the answer that came back was, you've used HSI boards, and that's why it's more expensive. Does anybody know here what HSI boards are? Nobody. You know, Stuart. High-speed interconnect. I didn't know. I had no, I'd never heard of this before. Nobody put their hand up, so either you're shy of putting your hand up or you don't know either. I never heard of HSI boards. What do you do if you don't know HSI board? You, you, you look up Dave NM0S over here and you ask him because he knows everything about everything. But you don't want to bother him because he knows everything about everything. He must be an important guy. So you ask Google instead. And it turns out all to be down to this issue of wires. The wire is the little hole between the top layer and the bottom layer that you use to transit a signal between the two layers. But when you do a multi-layer board, you can have blind wires, which means that only one side is on the surface of the board and it doesn't go all the way through. And you can have hidden wires which connect two internal layers. And so the top and the bottom of the wire don't show up on either surface. It's all internal. But apparently this is much harder to produce that kind of PCB and they call that HSI, high speed interconnect, and the price goes through the roof. <laughs> so I had to spend two days redesigning my board so that I didn't have any of those blind wires or hidden wires. This is all stuff you, you have to learn. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's quite complicated because you might have these wires connecting signals on internal layers, and then you might have components on the, on the surface, and there's no interference because those internal wires are invisible on the surface. But now if you remove those so they're going all the way through you've got a collision between a component or a trace that's on the top surface with the wire that now came all the way through so I had to rearrange everything and do that kind of thing anyway that's uh, a lot of stuff <laughs> so some of this i've talked about already and I, I won't need to talk about again but just to go through the design increments of qdx compared to qmx first is about the microcontroller I used a much more powerful microcontroller. This one, I'm running at 168 megahertz. I had to use a 100-pin QFP because I needed a lot more I.O. than it is in the 64-pin chip in QDX. And it has a really huge 512K flash, 128K of RAM. Um, it has, uh, I had added a 128K EEPROM chip. So there's a huge possibility for future expansion on the software of the radio. And all of that we can implement as firmware updates. As I said, that's the great thing about SDR. You can implement all these firmware updates um, for free with, with very easily to your users. It has a 12-bit ADC with uh, tons of channels, uh, lots of peripherals like I2S, which we use for communicating with the ADC. And it also has this 12-bit uh, DAC, which was actually one of the main reasons why I chose this chip. It's also STM32F446. It's the same processor which I used in the QSX. So again, it's a stepping stone towards what many people are waiting for, the QSX. So that's the processor. The buttons and encoders, again, it's very similar, the board plug-in to the QCX Mini, but whereas QCX Mini has a gain control on the left-hand side, uh, a potentiometer, I have two rotary encoders, so the audio gain is done completely digitally because it's a digital embedded SDR radio. But that also provides us with a, an additional button because in the, rot in the shaft of the rotary encoder is a button. And so I'm using the left button as an on-off switch as well as a band change switch and a mode change switch between CW and digital modes. Um, audio headphones output, so I use a 24-bit stereo DAC chip and drive these two, or these two op amps here. So in QCX Mini, this is kind of an idea from QCX Mini providing the audio output from uh, just from op amps to headphones. And in QCX Mini, it's a single op amp. Here we have two op amps, so it's twice the drive power audio drive of QCX Mini. And I kept it stereo throughout so that later we could do things, for example, like 
if you wanted to have more volume on one ear than the other, if people had a hearing difficulty on one ear, not the other, you could adjust the, the, the volume between the ears. You could do things like binaural reception um, or split frequency operation where you implement a second receiver on a different frequency. Um, all of these kind of advanced features would be possible if you have uh, stereo audio output all the way through. And so I wanted to design the hardware as flexible as possible so that in the future, lots of exciting firmware stuff can be done. I also added the SWR bridge. Uh, one of the occasional problems that people have had with QDX is when there's a very bad SWR, SWR mismatch, you can put a high voltage on the transistors or a high current and it can damage the power amplifier transistors. And so I wanted to also make it more useful for portable operations and have a built-in SWR meter. So I used this very simple uh, standard kind of bridge circuit with two transformers. Um, a lot of the time you see this built with two ferrite, trans uh, two ferrite toroids with one transformer on each. The interesting feature of a binocular core, which not everybody knows, is you can wind a transformer in each hole and those it behave as two separate transformers which can't see each other. There's no interaction between those two transformers, the, the ones uh, wound on each hole. Another interesting thing, I have a cutout on the PCB and that binocular sits down inside the cutout because there isn't enough height for it to sit underneath the right-hand rotary controller of the controls board that plugs in. So there's all these mechanical considerations that also feed in. Um, so I use the binocular in this case, because it's a lot less space than having two separate toys, and this thing has tons of components crammed into a very small area, so I had to save space. Now, switching power supplies, this is my favorite thing in the whole radio and is a really fascinating topic. Why does it matter? If you look at QCX Plus, it uses about 112 milliamp. If you look at QCX Mini, it's reduced to 72 milliamp. Uh, we use a, a lower current op amps in Q6 mini and run the LCD backlight that are lower current. Um, QDX uses about 150 milliamps. QMX on a 12 volt linear regulator supply uses about 220 milliamps. That means your radio is going to be dissipating about 2.6 watts on receive. And Yes, the performance is very, very high, but when you talk to people who've got like a mountain topper or something else, and the performance is a lot lower because they're just using an SA602 superhead, but they will tell you, yeah, but I'm on the top of my mountain if my batteries run flat because the thing uses too much current, it's no point having the performance. You know, I'd rather have lower current consumption and lower performance. And, and so it, it's all goes together. And why it uses so much current is because when you do SDR, you have to use a powerful CPU to get good performance from it. And that CPU running at high speed uses power. It, it uses quite a high current. So if you use a linear regulated supply, you would have a 220 milliamp current consumption. I wanted it to be much, much lower than that. And so I developed a, um, what did I do? So I developed these buck converter switching supplies, which drastically improve the performance and lower the receive current. The challenge in this is noise. And for this purpose, I developed a unique approach, which is my favorite thing in the radio design and is a new step on top of both QDX and Q6 mini. So it's the new thing that I'm adding. And what I did was develop this idea from the QDX in the revision four, I think it was of QDX, I had this uh, buck converter design made from discrete components. Um, and the micro generates the PWM and the micro operates as the control loop. So it's reading the output voltage with an ADC input, an analog to digital convert converter input of the processor. And it's working out, does it need a wider or a narrower pulse width modulation, pulse width to control the, the uh, switch here that is part of the buck converter. So the microcontroller forms the control loop um, and you have a few discrete components which form the actual converter. So I developed on this and triplicated that. So in the QMX, there are three of these circuits. 
one for the five volt supplies, one for the 3.3 .3 volt supplies, and one for the pin dial supply, which is the same as in QDX. You still have the issue of noise, and everybody knows a linear regulator is relatively quiet. A switching regulator can be very noisy, and this is a, this is the problem that we have to solve. So a linear regulator, you know, is, is something like a, a, a variable resistance whose resistance is varied in order to keep the output voltage um, as, as you wish it to be five volts, for example. Whereas a switch, a buck converter switches a transistor on and off, and that's what gives it its very high efficiency because the transistor being either off, no current is flowing, or on, all the current is flowing through a very low resistance, means very little power is dissipated in, in the switch. So that gives it its high performance, but it also, because of these very sharp edges, and you want them as sharp as possible to get the high efficiency, it means you have harmonics from DC to daylight, or from 100 kilohertz to daylight, you have all these harmonics operating up. And because most inexpensive switching regulator chips have an internal RC oscillator, which has massive phase noise because it's just an RC, a low Q RC oscillator, as well as it drifts all over the place. At the harmonics, you get these wide bands of a few kilohertz worth of noise that travel up and down the band and kill your radio reception for five kilohertz either side. And so on QDX on the pin diode regulator, it doesn't matter because it's only used on transmit and you don't need a high pin diode current on receive. But here in QMX, these five volt supply and the 3.3 .3 volt supply are going to be used for the main power supply. So noise is going to be critical. So what did I do? I didn't try to eliminate the noise. I tried to control the noise. And the important thing here is the unique kind of step forward on from my idea here is the microcontroller generates the PWM and the microcontroller knows the operating frequency. So the microcontroller can look at where the harmonics are going to fall. And if they're going to fall near the operating frequency, just move the frequency a bit. So it moves away from the operating frequency. Is that cool? I love it. So here it is in practice, and I was I was I have some FT8 here on 14074, the FT8 frequency. I don't particularly like FT8. It's a big debate. Personally, I don't particularly like it, but it's very, very convenient for testing your radio when you're developing it because there's tons and tons of FT8 activity. So you can always go there and you know what's going to happen and it'll be easy to make QSOs and, and see the activity. So on 14074, you see we're only a couple of kilohertz away from this harmonic here, uh, which was at 14072. So we're only a couple of kilohertz up, but even that close by, it's actually not interfering with the, uh, with the reception at all. But if I tune down to 14071, which is in the top half here, I can very, very easily see this massive noise here, which would make reception impossible in that area. Now look what happens at 14071 when I move the PWM frequency so it's away from the operating frequency. I get completely clear reception. So it's magic. And you end up with... Um, you end up with a switching regulator, which gives you low current consumption, but without the disadvantages of noise, because the noise has been moved. The significance of this is hard to overstate. You can have basically uh, a very simple buck converter circuit, discrete components. You know, a switch mode chip will be designed by a team of proper engineers in TI or LT or whoever the semiconductor factory is. Here we just have a few discrete components that's you know, basically designed by an idiot. But by controlling where that horrible harmonics occur, we can move them and not be affected by them. So it was a fantastic thing and it really, really works very well in practice. Um, we do now have a chicken and egg problem or in other ways, a little bit incestuous, the whole thing, because the microcontroller is the control loop, but the microcontroller needs 3.3 .3 volts supply to be the control loop. So something has to come first, right? 
So how we get around this is by using a 78M33, a linear voltage regulator for 3.3 volts, that when you switch on the radio, this thing operates at the startup and generates 3.3 volts until it ramps up the PWM and the buck converter and the switching converter is, regular, is, is ready to take over. And there's also a 47 ohm dummy load on the switching regulator output, which provides some load for it to operate into until the microcontroller has got everything stable. And then when it's ready, it switches an IO pin, which is called LIN reg N here. It switches that and it switches over to the, to the uh, switching regulator, the buck converter. And here is a screenshot from when you switch on the on button of the radio. And the 3.3 volt supply is the blue trace. The yellow trace is the five volt supply. And you can see how I've got my uh, scope probes on these two supply rails. And when you switch on, you get the 3.3 volt here from the uh, 78M33. And at a quarter second after switch on, it's revved up the voltage regulator and it switches over to the switching regulator here. And meanwhile, the five volt regulator comes up. And when that reaches five volts, we do the initialization of the audio ADC chip, which runs off five volts um, and, all, and the SDR. So everything, everything on the SDR starts up when that five volt rail is ready. It works really, really well. You might think that it's very dangerous in some way because you have a, basically a P-channel MOSFET, which goes from 12 volts straight through to your 3.3 volt line. And if that got stuck in the on position, you would have 12 volts feeding through to the microcontroller. There would be a lot of bad smells and smoke and stuff like that. In reality, you can actually put a lot of safety hooks in. You know, if the processor reset itself or locked up, or if the processor is in the bootloader mode you, and those PWM lines go into high impedance state, you just have a resistance to ground so that the PWM is off. And so, and you can also then measure the PWM duty cycle at various supply voltages. So the radio can measure its supply voltages continuously thousands of times per second, and then relate that to the duty cycle with a table of values. So it knows its own performance curve. And if that duty cycle strays outside the performance envelope, it can then just shut down everything to protect itself. So you it's effectively like a kind of current limiting so you can put all of this into, and you might think, you know, while I was developing this, I must have blown up a lot of processes accidentally by having the wrong duty cycle. I didn't blow up any. It was easier than you might think somehow, right? I blew up lots of other stuff, but not during the development of the switch mode power supply. Um, there was a point where I had like a tantalum capacitor on backwards and you know, tantalum capacitors are not like electrolytics. Electrolytics, they just blow up, whereas tantalum capacitors actually catch fire as well. And so there's all these flames coming up and all the girls in the lab were screaming and Hansi, okay, okay. I, was, I didn't even answer. I was just, you know, putting out the fires, trying to... <laughs> no, I just removed the charred remains of the tantalum capacitor and desoldered them and put in a new one on the same board and it was fine. Um, obviously put it the right way around this time. The other thing we have is a soft power switch, which is quite a nice feature. So you push the button to switch on, and then you push the button again to switch off. So you don't need a toggle switch or slider switch or anything to have an actual power switch in the radio. Um, and that's implemented here by these P-channel MOSFETs at the input, which also provides reverse polarity protection. This, was a, this comes from an article I wrote for the ARL handbook. I'm not sure it's still in the current edition, um, it was a circuit that, that I wrote for the handbook. Um, so here's the five volt regulator on the right side. And again, the same arrangement that's common to the three voltage regulators. So that's the switching supply and you know, my favorite part of the radio. And I had a lot of fun designing that and in doing the firmware and everything. The duty cycle, this shows how the duty cycle works in practice. Um, as you go to lower supply voltages down here, of course, the duty cycle has to be higher in order to generate the required five volts and 3.3 volt output. Um, in practice, the current consumption that I measure at 12 volt supply is 80 milliamps. So it's dropped from 220 milliamps to 80 milliamps. It's a very, very big improvement and a very worthwhile improvement. 
that's with the backlight off. With the backlight on, it only uses about another six milliamps. So a big improvement in heat, heat dissipation. And just for comparison, the, the Aircraft KX3, if you look on their website, is an embedded SDR performance with a comparable performance. Um, and they say on their website, the received current is as low as 150 milliamps. So really having this level of performance in an SDR with only an 80 milliamp received current is a, is a really nice special thing. Now to come on to the final uh, part of the circuit, the RF envelope shaping. This is where I mentioned before the five watt power, amp power amplifier uh, circuit. And it had this kind of interesting differential amplifier. Effectively, it works a bit like a power op amp. It tries to compare the value of a DAC at its input with uh, a, a fraction of the output voltage. And this is like the feedback resistors and on standard sort of inverting amplifier op amp configuration. And it controls the output voltage here to be the same as uh, a multiple of the input voltage. So I use the 12 bit DAC to tell it, an, to tell it the voltage and there's about a factor of six gain between the two uh, to the output voltage. I had huge problems with this of instability. Uh, so it had horrible oscillations at about one megahertz at certain parts. So I generated a ramp going up from zero volts to uh, 12 volts here, I think it was. And at certain points, as it approached the top, you've got this horrible one megahertz instability, roughly one megahertz uh, oscillations. And in the end, I don't know what I said here, uh, I understood that it was down to this sliz, slick lie pair. Dave knows everything. Dave, do you know if I'm pronouncing this correctly? <laughs> Sickly, sickly, like someone who's feeling, like someone who's feeling sick. Okay, I will be able to remember that. And this came originally because back in the old days, they wanted an NPN power transistor in a circuit, but when everything was germanium and NPN power transistors were very, very expensive, but PMP transistors, power transistors were easily available. So they could convert a PMP power transistor into an NPN power transistor effectively by using this uh, configuration with, a, with two different transistors, a PNP and an NPN. It has very high HFE, just like a Darlington. The HFE, the gain, is a product of the, the gains of the two transistors. And in the old five watt power amplifier, I had got away with that because I was using quite an old transistor as the power transistor with a very low gain. But in the QMX, I, was, I had chosen an SMD, a modern SMD power transistor, and it was a lot higher gain. So I think the product of those two gains was so gigantic that the control range that the, the thing had, that the differential amplifier had to do in order to get it to swing from zero to 12 volt was so small that you, had, you were open to this instability occurring just by having too much gain. So I thought instead of having a sickly pair, why don't I just put a straightforward PMP power transistor in? By the way, the only reason I use a sickly pair in the five watt power amplifier is because at that time I'd moved from Japan where I was living to Turkey to do QRP labs full time. And I didn't have any equipment with me and I was trying to develop this five watt power amplifier while my whole lab equipment was coming on the boat and taking three months to come from Japan. And I wanted to be able to continue my development and I didn't know that in Turkey, it's very, very easy to find components. We have distributors like the equivalent of Digitigi Mauser and everything arrives two days later for like $1 postage or is very easy. But I didn't know that at the time. And my only idea was to go down to the local TV repair shop, which is still a thing in Turkey and you know, take your broken TV and they fix it. And there's always an old guy out the back soldering things and fixing TVs. And, and so I went over there and he had this old TV chassis with all these power transistors, of course. And so I grabbed that so I could continue my development. So that's how I went with a sickly pair. In this case, I thought, okay, I just try a simple PMP transistor. And I reached to my transistor box. And the first thing I saw was a P-channel MOSFET. And I thought, why am I being so stupid? Why not try a P-channel MOSFET instead of a, P a PMP transistor? The MOSFET has the advantage that you won't lose 0 0.7 volts across it. And, you know, I was already using P-channel MOSFETs in the switch mode 
regulate in, in the uh, reverse polarity protection circuit and soft on-off power switch I showed you just now. So I already have the part in my circuit. It's already in my bomb. So I can just use that. And it just worked perfectly. So that was my solution. I use the same AOD 403 that I use everywhere else. And um, it works really well. There was no instability at all. In practice, it gives uh, for a supply voltage here from zero to nine volts in this case, it gave a very, very smooth linear relationship between the supply voltage to the power amplifier and the peak to peak output. So 45 volts here being uh, five watts uh, RF. Very linear control range of about 37 dB for that DAC control voltage. Now, the final thing I want to talk about here is the possibility of using SSB on this radio. And I included in the radio this electric microphone on the controls board. And I also included that you can plug in to the PTT port a microphone and a, and a PTT switch and use it. So use a, a microphone plugged into the PTT port. I haven't done any firmware for this. It's something that I'm thinking for the future, uh, for the coming weeks and months that I will continue the development on the firmware. And it will try to, I want to try to do SSB in the same way that it's done on the USDX. So if you're familiar with the USDX, I'm sure many of you are, they use this technique called envelope elimination and restoration, where you take the SSB signal and you break it apart into its phase component and its amplitude component. And you apply the phase component phase shift to the power oscillator that's, that's uh, feeding the power amplifier. And you apply the envelope shaping to as an RF amplitude modula modulation on the power amplifier. And magically, according to all the maths, the SSB signal comes out the other end and you don't need a linear power amplifier for it or a linear driver chain. So it's perfect for QMX and also for USDX, which was originally based on QCX with its class E power amplifier. Um, so the aim is to uh, see if we can do a decent performance SSB transceiver on QMX. I'm optimistic that we will be able to. The QMX has quite a lot of advantages compared to USDX, a very much more powerful processor. They're using an 8-bit AVR processor at 20 megahertz. We've got a 32-bit ARM Cortex-M4 at 168 megahertz with floating point instructions, DSP instructions, a 37-bit linear control range compared to they get about 20 dB of amplitude control range by a DC with generated from PWM applied to BS170 gates, which are, this is a, the hardware capabilities of the QMX are very much higher than they have on USDX. And so hopefully that should enable QMX to produce a very good quality SSB signal. However, the proof will be in the eating, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. And so at the moment, I haven't done any development or investigation on that. So this is like a future goal. So that would be very exciting, not just because it would provide SSB capability to QMX. Uh, then, of course, it would be truly multi-mode, all modes, not just CW and Digi. But it would also be able to do all the other Digi modes like WinLink and VARA and PSK31, which, which traditionally require a linear amplifier. So that would be very exciting and, and is one of the things I hope that we can develop with QMX. Currently the firmware, I consider it to be beta. Um, my aim for Dayton was to be able to get the QCX functionality and the QDX functionality in the radio and that's it. So basically that, you know, coming back to the beginning of the presentation where I was talking about the evolution of these software blocks and hardware blocks and how I was reusing everything. The current firmware in QMX is basically a ported version of Q6 Mini and a ported version of QDX, so sort of roughly stuck together in some horrible way. And it needs to be tidied up um, so that it, it integrates far more seamlessly. Um, so there's a lot of work to do on firmware, but the good news, you know, we've used hardly any, any percentage of the RAM and only about 25% memory of the flash memory, the program memory. Firmware updates are free and easy, and anybody can do them just by copying a file like you would to a USB flash drive. So there will be a lot of uh, development over the next weeks and months um, to, to improve that. 
This is another in practice uh, result. So this shows in the blue line is the QCX CW audio response. And the red line is the QMX digital CW filter response. The digital CW filter is currently set to a 300 Hertz bandwidth. As you see, it's a very, very high sharp shape filter. It's a very sharp filter and it sounds very nice as you tune across the signals really just disappear completely. Um, again, in the future, there's be scope for defining your own filter bandwidth or having a variable filter bandwidth. There's a lot of things that can be done with an SDR and it's all just software. My first QSOs, um, again, as I said, I like to use FT8 for testing purposes, uh, not particularly for anything else. I put this on 20 meter daytime. I immediately had QSOs with several stations out to about one and a half thousand, 2000 miles distance. I was at that time too scared to turn the power supply out to 12 volts. So I was operating on about seven volt supply <laughs> in case uh, anything wasn't quite right. At least I would have less chance of smoke and horrible smells and more screaming girls in the lab. And so I had it on about seven volt supply, which was giving about a one watt power up. It worked very, very nicely. I had immediate replies, um, easy QSOs, as you can see, uh, the receiver looks very clean. Um, so it was a very good result. So the good news, QMX is available now. Uh, the price is $95. Uh, compare that to a QCX single band CW rig with its AGC and its TCXO, which people normally buy it with, comes to about $72. QDX is $69. So it's not really a very big increment, but it provides five band CW as well as digital and a lot of future possibilities, um, hopefully for SSB and uh, other, other things, the SWR bridge, all of these things that can be included. The enclosure is uh, same as the Q6 Mini, $20. We're also going to offer an assembled. So we, we currently offer an assembled version of QDX and Q6 Mini and Q6 Plus, which has a $45 fee that includes assembly and calibration and testing. We're going to do the same thing on this, but $50 is a lot more complex radio to build, so a small increase. Um, I want to thank particularly Dave VE3KCL, and Ross EX0AA, we shipped, I had shipped boards and parts to the Dayton Holiday Inn. When I got here on Monday night, they were very pleased to see me because their storeroom was packed with 20 boxes of my stuff. I had to do that because, you know, I'm traveling from Turkey. I can't bring 100 kilograms of stuff in my luggage. So we sent it all. And these two guys have done a most monumental task in our hotel room upstairs, packing kits. Uh, there was some SMD rework that was required to fix the problem with the boards, the manufacturing problem. There was uh, programming of the bootloader onto all of the boards. It was a monumental task. We spent the last two days working 16, 17 hours a day. 1.30 last night, we finished packing the 390th kit. So we have serial numbers one to 390 and their enclosures all packed up. Of course, you can have it without the enclosure. I think most people would have it with the enclosure. It's a small addition. If you did want to have it without the enclosure, I would prefer that you would order it online because we have everything packed up together here. So thanks very much to Ross and to Dave for the tremendous effort over the last two days. Uh, <laughs> I really, I really, really couldn't believe that we would be able to complete it, but we did. And nobody could believe that we would be able to complete, given the work that had to be done. Um, you know, I'm a little bit nervous when they see the state of our room. It's like factory, you know, there's rubbish all over the floor. <laughs> Total mess. So um, how do we get back to that last page? I didn't remember that was the last page. Yeah. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for listening. And uh... thank you. I see we've gone drastically over time. And uh, uh, if Dave ever invites me back here again to speak, 
he's not going to make the same mistake of putting me at the end, right, Dave? <laughs> Have we got time for questions? Can we do questions? Questions. Has anybody got questions? Yeah, the question is about whether we will do a high band version. Absolutely. And I meant I did mention this. Um, we I have to start, it's very, very difficult producing a kit. There's so many things that can go wrong, sourcing, PCB manufacturing, kitting. There are a million things that can go wrong. And so I start step by step with just this version. But the step to a high band version is really, really small because we've already done it with QDX and we know all the filter values, the capacitor values. I have all the components ready. So that will come soon, uh, the high band version. Another question? There was some here. Yeah. Parts availability. How much is parts availability hitting me? This has been hitting me for three years. And we had to be very, very nimble over the last three years. There are people who've almost gone out of business, probably some that even have gone out of business because they couldn't get the parts they needed. The last three years has been a nightmare. It's a matter of when we couldn't get hold of a part, we had to redesign around some other part. So for QDX, there was an ADC change and then a whole three months of design effort around the new ADC chip. It's been a constant struggle to get hold of parts and to try to find substitutes and so on. It does seem to be easing. Um, we didn't have any trouble getting hold of any of the parts required for the QMX production this time. Prices are still much higher than they used to be pre-pandemic or pre the crisis, whether they're related or not, who knows. But um, it's, it's getting better, but it has been a struggle. Stuart. The low power problem for the QDX. So the problem that Stuart is talking about, you're supposed to ask questions about this, but okay, fine. Um, so the problem he's talking about is that as a percentage of high band QDXs have this weird low power problem on 10 meter band. And it's caused, we believe, by some nasty parasitic resonance, which is lossy, fairly low Q, and which sucks power out. And so instead of getting four watts or three watts output, you get one or one and a half watts output. Uh, Ross EX08, by the way, you, if you see these guys anywhere around, please buy them beers, buy them whatever they want, treat them. Ross EX0AA has done a lot of work on this, and he came up with these transformer designs that involve bifilar twisting the power transformer and very tight coupling between the two, which we have found completely solves the problem. And it's been discussed on the QRP Labs group forum. And there are two designs. One of them he calls uh, our, our, uh Weird Twisted Sisters Transformer, yeah. WTST, and the other one he calls R, really weird Twisted Sisters Transformer. And you know, you've got to, it's a matter of how the design is to get the wires coming out of the right ends that fit in the hole, but they do seem to completely just solve the problem. So, one of the things, that, one of my tasks when I get back home from this event is to update the documentation for QDX to show how to do that. By the way, for QMX, I have written the user manual completely, sorry, the assembly manual completely and the schematics manual. Um, the ongoing effort to finish the operating manual for QMX is coming over also in the next week or two as well. Um, but the assembly manual is written and I need to just upload it again to the uh, QRP Labs website. Um, maybe I'll set that up tonight, a simple page to be able to do that. Um, so we will have these available tonight at the vendor evening, um, as well as some other kits. Um, have we got any other questions? What I come back to you, Stuart. Yeah. You've got to decide where to put the ground plane somewhere. And from an RF perspective, a power plane, as long as you have sufficient decoupling, from the RF perspective, a power plane is quite similar to a ground plane, right? And you can look at, Dave, I feel so nervous standing next to this 
genius guy. I watched millions of YouTube videos about how to structure the layers um, on multi-layer boards. And there's a lot of different views on this. Um, some people say you should have on a four layer board, signal on top, signal on bottom, power plane on one, ground plane on another. Some of them say you should have two ground planes in sight and you don't need thick traces for, for power distribution. You know, an eight mil trace can carry an amp. Um, as long as you decouple it where it's used, you don't need wide ground planes for power distribution. So it, there's a lot of different views on it. Um, it's quite hard to know what's best. I'd like to your opinion later on that. We'll talk, I'll find you. You had one last question. Out of the box, it does SSB receive, no problem. Because it's all what QDX does SSB receive out of the box. It has a 3.2 kilohertz filter for digi modes, and it's the same. Uh, um, you know, for SSB and digital, it is, it, the receiver is, is the same. But was that the last question? Uh, the, Dave's definitely looking threatening here now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>